Good morning, class. Um, we are welcome back to our course on research, advanced qualitative research methods. I'm sorry about last week that we couldn't meet, uh, but this today we'll, we'll have a good time and then maybe round up next week. Um, what I'll try to do is, and I, I talked about case study the last time that we met, and I would like to talk about uh, qualitative data analysis. And I'll, I'll try and discuss uh, one of the analytical ways of looking at qualitative data. And later on, I'll move on to, um, hopefully, if there's not much time, I'll move on to other forms of analysis. There's pattern matching, there's thematic analysis, there's mouse and human approach. Now, I like to teach the mouse and human approach because it's a fundamental an analytical technique that can be able to be applied in thematic analysis, can be applied in pattern matching. So, in doing all of, in when you know mouse and human techniques, it's techniques that they are putting them together. You end up knowing the techniques that you can use for thematic analysis. You also know the techniques that you can use for pattern matching. Yeah. Now, I'm not teaching you based on software. I'm just teaching you based on having the qualitative data. You have transcribed, you have the text, and what you, have, what you can do, what you can do with it. And hopefully next week, I'll try and make time and see if I can introduce you to some of the different qualitative analysis softwares. But in reality, um, because most of you do case study, um, um, case study based work, you don't use the software as much as suspected. Because in case study, you have to build a story. So you just have to build a story, and after building the story, you can then put illustrative quotes in it. But if you are doing discourse analysis, where you are actually looking at somebody's discourse and what they are discussing and what they are saying, trying to get the sentiments in what people are saying then the, so those softwares can become very, very relevant. Or when your data is very, very, a lot of speech is given, uh, like text from different, different respondents are given, then that one becomes very relevant. But anyway, I in my when I, when I was doing my qualitative data analysis seminar in Manchester, I remember that they even taught us how to use even common word, then the word, the word document itself to be able to do analysis. How? By being able to Look for keywords and search search for it and label the keywords or send label sentences with certain labels so that you can be able to always index them when you want them. So there's only many different ways of doing the same work. But I'm hoping that we can be able to um do that based on software. Maybe a little bit, maybe I don't know, maybe if, if it works well, we need to do some some today. If not, we'll do I'll I may be able to use Word documents too. Okay, so that's about it. I don't, um, as we go on, I, if you have any questions, any previous things that we are talking about, um, you can ask me when the relevant time is up. Let me start with what you are supposed to do. Those of you who are talking and, and chewing or eating or something like that, please, can you mute yourself? Because you are disturbing the class. You know you have got some nice, uh, meals and you are eating. But since you are not giving us some, you eat it alone. Okay. So this session will discuss, discuss qualitative data analysis methods for qualitative research. And as I mentioned, I will look at mouse and human mouse approach and then genes and um, data analysis approach. Gene discusses case study and pattern matching. They also discuss cross case analysis. Yeah. But I will focus much more on mouse and human man for today. Okay, so um, the key topics to be covered are the session of the data analysis technique by Mouse and Huberman and the, the unit data analysis approach. These are covered in the book, chapter eight, if I'm right, or oh, chapter seven, sorry. So please look at chapter seven of my book. Some of you, when I teach, you don't even go back and read the book. So I wonder how you, why you bought the book. So I advise you to please read. If you read it, it will help enhance the understanding that you are gaining in class. Now, when we began last week, I talked about case study being a study of a bounded system, and which, are, which, is, which usually could be a single bounded system or a multiple bounded system over time, using or uh, through detailed in-depth data collection, which may include observation, interviews, audiovisual materials, and documents. And then be able to produce the case. The case itself has to have a case description, which will explain the context of the case. And then you can then follow up with the theme, the themes that you want to try and cover or explore. So the case study itself is a methodology that can be applied to both quantitative and qualitative. But according to Jean, the case studies are empirical investigation of phenomenon 
within the environmental context. So the context cannot be stripped from the case. I mentioned that with qualitative data and qualitative research, we don't strip the context from the case or from the from the study, what you are trying to study or from the data. Data should be interpreted with the with with in in with in with in regard of the context or in coincidence with the context. Quite the relation between the phenomena and the environment is clear, is not clear. So that means that the, the environment and then the data are collected are kind of intertwined. They kind of influence each other. So it's very difficult for you to even separate the two. Um, we looked at this as an example earlier. I don't want to go into details too much about that. But then what then is data analysis? Data analysis actually starts from when you start collecting data. People don't, don't take it don't believe it but that's when you start so because when you start collecting data you categorize the data that you have you label your data so you have actually started analyzing you even categorize your questionnaire this question is on demographic this question is on this variable this question is on leadership all of it you are trying analyzing the data you are trying to let an analytical frame has been used to establish the questionnaire so as the data is coming it sort gets sorted according to analytical frame okay so data analysis consists of examining, categorizing, tabulating, or otherwise pre combining evidence to address initial proposition of a study. Anytime we carry out data analysis, your objective is that we are doing something to the data to address the research question. So even in collecting the data itself, we categorize the data itself in a way that can appreciate, help us appreciate our proposed um, approach to address the research question. Our proposed approach to address, so if we, our proposed approach has some relationship or something variables, we will stretch our questionnaire to fit those relationships with them, that those variables so that we can explore whether the relationship has um, what the what the relationship contributes to understand the phenomenon. So sometimes we have maybe leadership. We are studying transactional leadership, and we are saying that transactional leadership is influenced by culture. So you are collecting data on culture, data on transactional leadership, and then to see whether there's a relationship in which transactional um, uh, leadership is influenced by culture. So the researcher relies on the experience and literature to present the evidence in various ways, using various interpretations. And one of the interpretations is with the theoretical framework that you have, or the research framework that you have. It will guide you in structuring the data that are collected. Okay, so we, in data analysis itself for qualitative research, uh, for case study, you need to be able to know about, not, not, uh, keep a number of principles in, 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 in perspective. First of all, how you manage your data, the choice of what to record and what not to record, the scribe, transcribing of what you have recorded into, into, into written text, the coding from the written text, the transcribed text of what you have found concern the phenomenon, identifying the patterns within the codes, and then being able to use that to write your analysis or what you have learned from that. So in mouse and human man, mouse and human man becomes an analytic that explains that data analysis starts from data collection, goes to data display, data condensation, and then a conclusion point where you have to draw and verify your conclusions. So he's saying that there are about four key building blocks within data analysis. And transcendental realism is about moving from one thing to, to, to lead to another. So one thing is that you are collecting the data, you are one part of the world, and you are moving to another part of the world, or moving to another perspective. So you have data collection, data display, data, data condensation, and then drawing and verifying conclusions. Okay. Now in the past, data record condensation may have been we used to be called data reduction. That's the 1994 model by Mouse and Huberman. But when they wrote a 2003 or 2008 version of the book, they changed it, or 2013, I can't remember, but there's one, the newer version of their book argues for a fourth dimension starting from data collection and says that the, the data doesn't really get reduced, it gets condensed when you do analysis. It's reducing means that you're actually stripping away some of the data. But what you are trying to say is that you rather get condensed into the meaningful means. Okay. 
So data collection. Data collection is when you start collecting data. When you develop your questionnaire, you go to the field and you start collecting data. But we say that analysis begins at that stage because the researcher is encouraged to read through the notes and sort out and categorize the data as they come. Even the way you structure a questionnaire lets you actually start categorizing the data or tabulating the data. So in that sense, you are started analyzing. Now, whilst you have watched your questionnaire, you can also make notes either on the margins of the questionnaire or the research book or your research diary where you keep your notes. Like a new information has come through our question that came up. And then um, the key the key highlights of what you have been able to pick from a, an interview process with somebody or from what the person, um, whether it, from someone who has completed with the interview or for someone who has completed with the study, you will be able to pick ideas from the person. So once you are picking this and you are, you are expressing the person, you can write some of those ideas in your notes your notebook or some people write at the margins of the questionnaire. And whatever it is, in interacting with, data and with respondents, you learn more than what you may be requesting. Uh, you might likely learn more than what you are requesting for. So you may want to put those points down. Okay. So that's where you have data collection. Then, so in data collection, it covers, in, in from us, you remember on the data collection part captures the first three steps manage your data record your record or not to record and then transcribe your interview so let's look at what goes into it there are different forms of data common four are the observation interviews documents and text and audiovisual so one question you should ask yourself is that in what format is the data coming from coming is reaching me or what what format of data am i also generating for my study and how best can I be able to use that one in my work? Okay. But Yin talks about the fact that there are six sources that are documentation, archival records. So you can separate documentation from archival records. And then you have got interviews, direct observation, participant observation, and physical product or service. Okay, so the fiscal product or service is an examination. That's what we call the artifact examination, where you examine a fiscal product or you can examine a service. When we met the item, we talked about the fact that irrespective of whatever data you are collecting, you are supposed to establish reliability and validity. Validity has three forms constant validity, that making sure that whatever you are measuring, you are actually measuring with the right operational measures so that you can move really to get the information you are looking for. So if you type, if you have a question on age, you have to make sure that whatever you are obtaining is the actual age that you want, to, you are looking for, that will best fit your study. Are you looking for the actual age of age groups? Which one, whichever one will best fit your study, you should think about it. You are also making sure that if you have got a variable like performance, who is disturbing us? Now, the variable like brand love, how are you going to measure brand love? So, what have other people to measure it so that can guide you in measuring yours? Then we've got internal validity. That means that everything information you are obtaining, there is internal, is internally valid. There is enough information to call within the case itself to corroborate whatever you are looking for. So there's enough information to be able to establish the next action can take, take place. So sometimes people want to be sure that if you say that, okay, you are interviewing, um, let's say, informal workers, and all of a sudden you start saying that 80% of these informal workers can read and write uh, or can be able to use WhatsApp effectively. The question is that they, we are presuming that they can read and write, but I will be able to establish earlier that these people have got some basic knowledge and education so that you can be able to call upon that particular uh, uh, argument you are placed across earlier so that we can use it in your in your in your in a, in a sentence in, in subsequently so anytime that you make any argument where well, right realize that there's the argument that i've done is it internally valid is there enough information within the case that can give me some form of validity to be able to say this or a good or a good reason or a causal relationship that can be able to warrant this outcome then external validity to what where extent that to where can you um, um where, to what extent can we generalize our findings? Okay. 
Now we have to know that in qualitative research, we generalize theoretically, we don't generalize quantitatively or statistically. We're not looking for numbers, we're looking about the theoretical just um, the theoretical generalization, where you check what the theory is saying and what the you have found to see how far you are from the two. Okay. The reliability means that you are demonstrating that the operations of the study given maybe a, a time being constant. When I go and collect the data, I can repeat and get the same results. So that's what will come up. So to be able to achieve all of these, we have certain principles that have to be satisfied or tactics. For cultural validity, we have got multiple sources of evidence, establish a chain of evidence, also review your draft case report as you're writing it, case study report. Internal validity, because you want to really show, show that something occurs before other things can occur, we need pattern matching to support with that explanation building. To explain what rival explain, to explore what rival explanations could exist or why are they existing and what could be the other alternatives. And then to use logic models to be able to explain complex uh, things or processes. Okay. Then you can and then you can also use to explain steps. Okay, steps in an issue, steps in an activity. Okay. Then I've got internal external validity, which you can use the theory, you can compare the findings to the theory, or you can look at um replication logic. We find out whether any other study, we find out whether um any other data source that you're calling a respondent can confirm what you have found in the first case. So is any other case that is synonymous to what I found in the first case? Then you can use replication logic to be able to point and uh, to establish that. Then you have the uh, reliability in terms of reliability of the study where you can then draw on case study protocols, what people wrote and said they would do and, and how they were going to do that study. And then when they actually did it, That'll be a key state database. Yeah, here it is. So you have got the reliability where you use protocols which you are using, you develop before you go into the, the study or the case study activity. Then you have also got opportunity of developing the case study database of what is necessary and then use and then using that case study database to point out that these are the people I interviewed, these are the what they said. These are the key, uh, um, key where I interviewed them at. What the, what the issues, condition or condition are the same at, at that time I did the interview. What were some of the things that influenced the inter interview processes? You may capture all of this into your case study database. If I follow that and go back to where you collected your data, I should be able to get similar results. Okay. There's no question so far. So there are three principles. Hello, bro. Yes, please. Um, yeah, um, I wanted to find out just a previous slide. You know, with the qu quantitative, there are there are numbers that uh, you you need to meet. Let's say you are trying to do construct validity. Uh, there are specific numbers. Okay, with with uh, qualitative, with even using these tactics, uh, are there guidelines like how many multiple sources of evidence do you need? before somebody can say that your study or your data collection uh, is, is following regular, uh, How many chain of uh, maybe evidence do you have to establish? Are there some guidelines with respect to numbers? Okay, it's a good question. Me, um, yeah, I think the best way to answer is for you to actually look at it being done in practice. And if you take your time, go and find this paper, Introduction of Accounting Practices in Small Business, Family Business, and then read the methodology section. The author talks about how to achieve all of them in a study, and I want that's a practical case. So you read a sample part, how you selected a sample, how you achieve reliability. Now you are talking about construct validity. So you, you said, well, uh, construct validity, and the internal validity and then external validity. So look at the external validity here. We use replication logic, just as I showed you, to enhance the external validity of our study. We initially collected data from three Mexican organizations and added two more, one case at a time. Okay. 
So we initially co collected data from three musical organizations and added two more, one case at a time, until we reached theoretical saturation. So you do that until you reach theoretical saturation. It's not like there's a specific number, but until you reach theoretical saturation, in which no additional categories of parties emerge from the analysis. That's Yin. Yin talks about the fact that anybody who's collecting data, in terms of your multiplicity of your data sources or your replication logic, what you should try and do is that you want to be able to make sure that any other respondents you are adding is not telling you anything new. It's just confirming what you had already. So after some time, you realize that the people who are adding, the target audience you are adding, are not telling you anything new. Are not seeing anything new or different. Why? Because you have reached a rich logical situation in which no additional categories, no additional themes, no additional perspectives can emerge from the analysis. The theoretical sample designed to include manufacturing and service companies from several industries fosters external, also fosters external validity. Okay. The findings for the particular state, which can serve as a small company installing. The findings were, we mentioned about the, the application logic to evaluate whether findings from one setting Mexico, one setting Mexico are repeated from the findings in another settings, USA. So please, if you look at the paper, they talked about a center valid they achieved, the internal valid they achieved, constant valid they achieved, and the last one, reliability they achieved. So this is an actual good one. Now we conducted our analysis using quantitative analysis software in vivo, the one I was thinking about using to help following the standard procedures of quantitative data. Why, why are they quoting? They're quoting mouse and human map. So at least you realize that I'm using the right way to be able to explain the things to you. Such software support the, the handle on unstructured data by providing audit trail and management tools to ensure consistency of coding tags or identifiers attached to segments of, of, of transcript, which I'll be showing you later, and interpretation of the data. In addition, the software links graphical displays to the coding and to source data, helping the researcher to Keep the interpretation, helping the researchers keep the interpretation close to the original data. Two researchers performed the analysis in the language. The interviews were conducted. Okay. Okay. Please, I was waiting for you to see whether you have it satisfies you. Yeah, yes, Prof. Thank you very so much. So when you study this, now that you have set aside, I can go ahead and do other ones. So that was good, better if I'm right. Yes, Prof. Oh, sorry. I'm about to that. There are students from HR um, Accounting and Co. I hope that was also clear for you. Yes, Prof. Thank you. Resta, good morning. <laughs> okay. Three principles of data collection for good morning, bro. Uh, good, okay. No, you're welcome. Three question three principles for case study for data collection for case studies. Okay. So one thing is that we as we saw in the um our, uh, in the previous slide, because we didn't want to achieve validity, all the three forms of validity and reliability, it's important that we use multiple sources of data. We create a, a case study database and maintain a chain of evidence. These three things matter. The chain of evidence is for what? It's for internal validity. Create a case study database is good for reliability. It's also good for um, constraint validity. And then use multiple sources of data is for what? Constraint validity and then internal validity. Okay, so look at the multiple sources of the cultural validity, a chain of evidence, uh, cultural validity, review your case study report, cultural validity. So all the trade that we saw next in the next slide um, is for cultural validity. But you see the same thing can be also be for, sorry. The same, the same thing can also be for reliability. It can help, it can enhance reliability. Then it can also enhance part of external validity. So this is matter. These things that we are putting together, they matter. Okay. So principle one, whenever you are doing a case study, use multiple sources. Even in writing the case, don't use only single. Why is Prof talking about how we should do the case when we are talking analysis? Because data analysis starts from the data collection. 
that is why we are going back again so don't be worried about that that's why we're going back when you are collecting your data you are presenting your data in your work don't let it come from only one perspective use diverse perspectives use diverse respondents so that you can triangulate from different people and make your arguments more convincing and accurate and sometimes you may realize that there's convergence and there's also there's non-convergence people will support each other others do realize that some of the viewpoints are not together know how to categorize them so that you can be able to understand what is okay so prerequisites for using multiple sources are cost knowledge in different data collection methods why because it costs more to collect data from diverse sources so if you are not got money that could be a constraint number two you have to use different data collection methods you have got interviews you have got focus group discussions which is part of interviews you have got audiovisual information you have got um direct observation participant observation all observations and you have also got um what else have we got documents and text so sometimes i'm um, using all the diverse sources of data collection can cost you more because since you know, ready since um, um uh, you may need money to be able to um run all these different data collection strategies it may be a little bit costly for you okay principle two. Oh, sorry create a case study database we mentioned that one a way of organizing documented data collected which increases your reliability of your research. So in the case study database, you are going to have your notes, your study document, tabular materials, narratives, open and, and, and close ended uh, answers to the questions. So those things, we would like to see some of the um, um, questions. Now it's not everybody that showcases everything like this in his work. So some people show sna snippets. Some people show snippets of these things. They show aspects of it, of it. So don't be surprised that if somebody doesn't have all of it in his work, in terms of the appendix on this body you can show that uh, there's an attempt there's an attempt to show that the person did that in his work it's an attempt to show that the person did that in his work so look at this example for um as one um joyce's work when you go down joyce is doing something in i think marketing or international business one of them Okay, dominant trait, personality traits among entrepreneurs are comprised of small and medium scale enterprises in the manufacturing sectors. So it's able to do a good job. She understood the, uh, what was required of her. So if you look at her conclusion and if you finish everything, you see that she has got some of the transcripts here based on the question. So interview eight, participant. Which center as your business founder service? You see, I is structuring already. Can you provide a brief description? How long has you uh, has your business been in operation? How many employees? What's your level of education? Then go to leadership. Do you think it's desirable to uh, desirable or imperative to be entrepreneur? Yes, it is. What's the role of leadership for you as an entrepreneur? So we get these viewpoints from them. Depending on the this on leadership, this on self confidence, to be able to build a picture of what a person is saying. Okay, so that one we collect it like as you are seeing, and then you, you move on to the next one. You present it. So this is just showing snippets of somebody's um, um, um case study uh, database. Just snippets of so it's good to show them in your own work. So I'm going to show something else. Like in my PAD, I showed the the interview guide, and I also showed the respondents that I, I interviewed and how many I interviewed, how many were interviewed at a particular point in time. I tried to show that. So those of you who have seen my PhD, you see that I, 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 I took some time to, to show that in my work. So that anybody who's reading my PhD can realize that he has enough information to check the um, uh, reliability of the work that I have done. Check the reliability of the work that I have done. Okay. Let me see if I can find. Okay, so let me see if I can find my. Just want to show you. I like to demonstrate, so I just want to show you that one. 
So this is the my PhD. Let me scroll down and, and then I'll, I'll zoom I'll zoom in into it. So if you look at my um, table of contents, you see it's there. So summary, look at this. Data collection, case study, case profiling, semi-structured interviews, artifact examination, documentary analysis, and data collection, contextual data. So I'm showing you all the things that I got from the field, the major things I got from the field in a key, in, 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 a, in a summer summarized way. And this is all coming from my key study database. So appendix four. Your guy, you know, I have a lecture, I'll tell you, make a... Okay, please, who, whoever the person, somebody should, should reprimand the person. He's disturbing you, your, 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 the students that you are here. Okay, so appendix four, case profiling. In order to build detailed cases, the data collection, data collected on selected films will cover the following areas. So this was part of what I did. Somebody said this is part of your protocol, but this is what you took to your film, but this is what you collected. So collect the questions uh, 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 later on these fields. Then this is my interview structure. Remember I taught you something on how to be able to identify different type of respondents and categorize this internal and external. Those are internal to the company, external to the phenomenon, internal to the phenomenon, external to the phenomenon. And what questions were I, was I asking? The interview questions are here. Sometimes you can have different questions for different administrators or some of the questions and the level of that sort of questions may, 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 may be better, maybe more suitable for another person. So to explore the role of the interview in the firm and the role of the e-commerce evolution and impact of e-commerce on the interviews role. Okay. Then I also did Artify examination where I was examining their website. So what was I looking for? I put all the information I was looking for on their website, including data I collected. The last part has to do with the Documentary analysis. What kind of papers? What kind of documents was I looking for? I was looking for organizational reports, e-commerce documentation, minutes of related meetings, electronic messages, financial reports, industry reports, change reports. Okay, so that gives you an indication of what I did. Then I have my contextual data where I collected data from 26 inter main interviews, 20 follow-up interviews. After all. Um, uh, full up interviews, a kind of snowball interviews. Then the organizations, how many were interviewed per organi in each organization? Then the list of, uh, um, um, then the case study, that's my pilot study. I did uh, 28 interviews to complete the understanding of Ghana business and ICT context. 22 were done the pilot study and six were done in the main study. Okay. Then what kind of, who are the people I targeted in that 28 interviews? Are the people I targeted? And you see that, you see it there. Okay, so now you have an idea of what your report may look like. Okay, so now let's, let me go back to my slides. If there's any question, I'll show you examples. Are the, are the examples helpful, please? Oh, I'm just wondering you. They're helpful. Yeah, very helpful. Extremely helpful. Okay. So remember that I said open narratives. That's what you saw in the joices with the um, EMB work I showed you. Then tabula, tabular materials, some information. If you got some statistics or like company information on their on their um, uh, on their financial performance, you can capture that one. And some documents that you captured in the results of the interviews and the service. The skills you need to be in terms of data collection should be that you should be good, ask good questions, be a good listener, be flexible and adapt, adaptable. You need to adapt to the situations that come up. Okay, so now you have seen all of them. Be, be unbiased and by perceived emotions. Have a firm grip of the issues being studied. Be adaptive and flexible, a good listener, and ask good questions. Okay, no question here, then let's go. What about the protocol for investigation? So one thing that you have to think about is that how do you carry out the, the studies? So now that I built, your, built some, collected some of the information, 
that will help in, will help instruction your case report. What what then will happen on the field? When you get to the field, you have to know that you are going to introduce your study to somebody. After introducing the study to the person, you are going to follow up with the study case study questions, and then you are going to then write out a report. But there are certain times that as you are in the field, new ideas may come, and you have to innovate or improve the report. So that one is welcome. That one welcome. Every good protocol that you develop will help the uh, repl replicability of the study. So now if somebody wants to um, 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 replicate it in the future, you can, you can it can rely upon that. This was very important information. This 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 information that the person is collecting, you can structure it this way. You can ask this question for this question, and then you can really get a very big good picture of what happened in that particular community or concern that phenomenon. So please, the protocol for investigation is important. The case study report will come out of your protocol for investigation. But the case study report is just an outline of what you want to collect or how you structure your report. But the protocol for investigation will capture where you are going to collect your data, the procedures you are going to use, the questions you are going to ask, and be able to end up generating the report. So by the time you finish your data management processes, you have been able to collect data uh, or, or collect data and then start looking at the patterns in the data to be able to establish that the data is worth analyzing. Okay, so when it comes to data condensation, we used to be called data reduction. You have a lot of data. You need to be able to break it down into pieces that at the end of the day, we can make, can make sense to us. Otherwise, the data itself, long text of people's comments doesn't tell us anything. So if the person is saying something, what does it really mean? What is he trying to say in essence in relation to your study? That's what you're trying to do. So it begins by segmenting and edit, editing and segmenting and summarizing the data. And then you go on to do coding. Coding is that you apply labels to it, and then you do memory. You find uh, clusters or links or patches between two or more codes that you need to memory. Then at the end of the day, you conceptualize to prove the point that what is really happening here based on the different um, codes you have been able to categorize and then be able to memory. Okay. So in all of it, you don't reduce the data from the Okay, you don't reduce the data by stripping it away from the context. You will, you will need to note that you, if you take the context away, you can't understand what is happening. So you have to rather condense, try to make sure that you will bring out an outcome that we can understand it by, by it, it still fits the contextual, the context that the, team, the issue you are discussing finds itself in. And I'll show you an example as you go on. Most of these things, they are actually going to be saying, but when we start doing examples, it becomes clearer. Okay. So let's pick our first aspect. You say you segment your data, you categorize your data, and then you actually move on to the coding process. Coding means that you have got a whole text and you are reducing that text into a single label or multiple labels. So you are dividing and using the data into meaningful segments. In fact, the word reducing again is not fair here. Uh, you are condensing the data into meaningful segments, meaningful segments. That's what I'll say. Condensing the data to reduce it and assigning labels or assigning names to them. Okay. Then you can after that you can combine the course to be able to identify whether they are border agreements the course are telling you. Then leave. So after you have been able to build the course and find the relationship between them, you can then be able to um can you can then be able to display the data that you have, other forms of it in terms of graphs, graphs, tables, and charts to be able to do comparisons better. Okay. So what goes into coding? Coding means I'm applying labels to a group of text. So the labels are called the codes or the tags or the names. When you put the tags or the names or the labels against the data, you have, you have coded. Now, data can, can be individual words or small or large chunks of data. Now, 
Now, the purpose of, of coding is to index the data so that it can be, become the base of storage and retrieval so that you can find out deep um, from a snapshot what is happening within a particular phenomenon. Number two, it becomes a basis for a new data because as you code, you are now moving the data level to the abstract world where you can be able to combine different codes to be able to tell a story of what is happening in, 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 in this sense. And lastly, you pull the, the things together that you have gained from the codes to be able to identify patterns. Now, because of, of these, every time we label a statement, a word, every single level and activity, we are assigning an identity to it. That identity becomes very, very important. So there are different types of identities or identifications that we can place on labels. The first one is the ones that are more concerning the descript description of what is happening. There's a five-year-old boy here. It's a, the descriptive book code is that he is a, a kindergarten person or he is a preschooler. So at, all he's, so at the end of the day, you know the type of person, what you can expect from that person. But I didn't say there is a preschooler here with five years. I said there's a five-year-old person here. If my study is about health, the family and home, by the time I read this five-year-old person here, it gives me an idea of the kind of people I'm going to live in the house. The next one is um, um, topic codes. Topic codes has to be with the fact that even though we have a description, sometimes the description can be discussing, can be focused on discussing a viewpoint. For example, you can say that the teacher who in your statement, the teacher who has only one car tends to come to office very late. He packs under the tree and he carries his bag alone to the class. Now that is a sentence I've, I've heard for maybe a, a security man I'm interviewing. Now there are several quotes in here. In terms of the descriptive quotes, I can see that there's a teacher who has, there's a teacher who has one car. So I can categorize him as a teacher who, 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 may not necessarily be rich, but he has settled for only one car. Okay. Number two, or a teacher who, somebody can even say a teacher who is very careful or who is very prudent or is a miser. He doesn't buy a lot of cars. He has only one car. Okay, good. Then I can also say something about it. I said a teacher who has one car and, and parks under the tree is always late. So I've seen that there's another descriptive code, lateness. Lateness about the teacher. I can see that there's another description about the teacher. So there's a late teacher here. Teacher who doesn't come to school early. Good. But in terms of topic codes, what is being discussed? In terms of topic this code, what is being discussed? Because well, all the things is a teacher who has one car and is always late, parks under the tree. Now that what is being discussed is about the location of parking. So maybe the study is about how um, 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 uh, like, uh, how the car park is how the park, car park of UGBS is well utilized by lecturers. That's maybe what the study is about. So one person tells you this information. It tells you that this lecturer parks under the tree. So if you go look at the characteristics of the tree that he parks under, maybe there's no space and you always go to park under the tree. So then that gives you another inference. So the descriptive code has given you a description of the person, the identity, the entity. The topic code has told you what is being discussed about the entity, what is being said about the entity. The teacher who has one car, and it's always sleep, packs under the tree. The two things is, the first two things are descriptive. The last one becomes what? The last statement there is where we can get our topic code, what is being discussed, the lateness of the teacher. But somebody can also say lateness is a description, but look at the way the sentence was construction, constructed. The, the lateness here is more about what is being discussed about the teacher. Now you can also have inferential codes and then pattern codes. Inferential codes is that we are pulling two or more units together. So if I add a descriptive code, one or one discrete code to one uh, maybe topic code, I can get a different meaning. That can enhance what you are trying to do, depending on what the question is. So one of the things that we said, a teacher who has one car and then a packs under a tree. So let's say the topic code is a pack and a tree. And, I, and then listen very carefully. And then the one of the descriptive codes is what? One of the descriptive codes is a teacher. So if I just add the two together, I can end up erroneously. I know because I don't know the context of what you are trying to study. I can end up, if the study is about 
car parking behavior of stakeholders of the University of Ghana, then I can say that teachers are more likely, I can say one, teachers are more likely to park under trees. Number two, teachers who have one car are more likely to park under trees. Number three, teachers who are late are more, are, are more likely to park under trees. Each of them have some truth in it, depending on the study I'm doing. So if I see, and it's more about the latter one, the latter one, the teacher who has one car, the teacher who has one car and is late, always park under the tree. Now, is he parking under the tree because he's late or is parking under the tree because he's a teacher? So that's like the reason why analysis is very, very interesting. So I don't have much information, but if, they, if I get more information, I start looking at patterns. I may be able to establish that teachers who are late always don't have enough place to park. So they end up parking under the tree. So it's not like teachers like parking under the tree, teachers who are late. If I take the first one, teachers, and then teachers should park under the tree, teachers park under the tree, it is erroneous. I have dropped one of the descriptive codes. So I'm just taking teachers and then parking under the tree, which is a topic that is being discussed. But if I own up it, adding them together, and adding the context in which the thing happens, and adding the frequency, because maybe I've got other data, how many parking car parking slots exist, how many teachers there are. When I start putting all this into principle, that's what you mean by triangulation. And I start pulling all this in. The first one, I'll be able to propose a truth. I propose that teachers park, uh, teachers who have one car park under a tree. But there could be a reason. And the second one, I said that. No, first I said teachers park under the tree. I said teachers who have one car park under the tree. The last one, teachers who have one car and are late park under the tree. I could also say teachers who are late park under the tree. It could be the latter two. Teachers who have one car and are late park under the tree. Or teachers who are late park under the tree. Now, I have to be able to collect other data to find out whether having one car tells you where to park. Maybe the rule says that all teachers have one sludge, have one have uh, 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 all teachers are attended to one slot. But if a teacher has two cars, you can park one out, uh, one in front here and go and park the other one under the tree. If that is what the rule says, that's and my context, that's why context is, context is what is happening within the environment. So the rules are in the environment and the environment can guide me in interpreting the data. So if one of the rules is that, if, if one of the rules is that, all teachers are entitled to park one car. Every other car you bring at the front of the department or in front of the school. Every other car you park, bring, bring, and go take to another tree. Now, so now it means that the teacher who has one car is one who is who that rule doesn't apply to him because he's not having two cars. So why is he still parking under the tree? Now, then I count and I find out that how many slots of car park exist. There are 12 slots of car park for 72 lecturers. Hmm. So the issue about the teacher parking under the tree, is it about the source not being enough? Then now it could be one, the teacher is always late. So he doesn't get a, a parking slot early. By the time he gets there, his friends have occupied the place. But somebody then will say that, ah, but prof, if you are saying that, then if there are only 12 slots and there are seven, there are 72 lectures, then there was every point in time, the, 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 the source will not be enough. But this one, the statement, the security man who I interviewed said is that the teacher who has one car, Parks, always parks under the, and is late, always parks under the tree. What the guy trying to tell me is that there is a characteristic about the teacher. He is late. So he's always not there coming early so that he can fill in the tongue. So it is not about the fact that the tea was not enough, which is also another issue. So the means that uh, in terms of critical realism, oh no, let me, I'm going too far. In terms of whilst well, a human one, there could be different surfaces of what could be the possible outcome. There could be the fact that the more data I collect, I realize I can rule out the fact that it is about the place being few and more about the lateness. Because if I start putting timetable and all those things together, what about if there are only 10 lectures in the place a day and still the teacher pass under the tree? That means that they, they can become about preference. But the, the guy said, and it's late, and it's late, and it's late, and it's late. That and it's late changes the whole thing, and it's late. It gives another thing. The teacher who has one car and it's late always packs under the tree. So the teacher has a late, uh, 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 an attitude of arriving late. Then he has one car. So the one car thing is not, is not, doesn't mean that you should go and park under the tree. He should have gotten a place in the front because it's only those who have got two cars that are being forced and put one of your cars under the tree. But because he's late and the place is only 12, 
So in the teacher does something about his lateness, there's likely that in the week he may be able to park in front. So the question about the fact that why does the teacher park under the tree is about because he's late, depending on the data I have. Because he's late, not because the place is small. The place is small is also true, but that's not the most important reason now. The most important reason is because he's late. Now, please you and I see where, how analysis works. What I've done right now is to tell, teach you descriptive codes, inferential codes, axial or, or, or pattern codes, because in pattern codes, I need more patterns to show. That's why the guy says it's always late. So that's a pattern. It's always late. It's always back and it. That's a pattern. So I'll be able to find out a pattern from that. When I put all of them together and look at the context information, I can be able to come up with what we call suggestive meanings or conclusions. And then I can verify and conclude. So if you look at the mass of human cycle, you have got, I'm coming. I'll, I'll come to the mass of human cycle. I've got display. Display means that you can display. You have got condensation and drawing and verify. So I drew three conclusions or four conclusions. One conclusion was that the teacher, teachers park under the tree. Then I said that teachers who are late, uh, teachers who are one car park under the tree, teachers who are late park under the tree, teachers who are one car and are late also park under the tree. So there are three conclusions here. Now I have to do verification by look at the context to be able to arrive. That is why after this, then what you do is that you do this one, selective coding. So you have to choose. So in this is this is the same thing as I was doing. This is the process way. This is more about the naming. This part is just the name of the course. This is more about the second one is more about the, the process with the process I was going through. And this one is what we is is also underpinned in grounded theory. In grounded theory, you, you build theory out of the data. So in the first level is open code. You have the interview text. You can code as much as you want to code. But your code can be should be influenced by either okay, either the literature or what what or either the framework that you have or the data itself so you can look at what does the theory tell you or what does the data itself tell you if i will use two of two the two or the, the two approaches the approaches are not an either or all decision you can the two can be used at the same time you can look at the framework and you can look at the theory you can look at the framework and you can look at the data itself you can combine both in fact most of you combine both so I will look at it to do my open code. Then I'll, that will help me to develop my my axial. Sorry, my um, topical code and descriptive codes. Then I go to axial code when I start bringing putting them together. Then I can that will help me develop my inferential pattern codes. Then I have to generate meaning out of the coding. So then I, I end up selecting a statement or two out of it, and then that will lead towards an outcome. Somebody said that problem. This thing I'm telling you, are you sure that this thing is true? Okay. Are you sure that this thing is true? This thing I'm talking plenty. Do we have to do that in thesis, actually? Okay. So, I'm going to show you how we do it anyway. But before I show you how to do it, I want to just jump a little bit to somebody's completed period and then see if I can find the person's slides for Viva. So like I can use that one to illustrate that one to illustrate what we are talking about. If I open the full thesis, it will waste it will take some time. But I can also open the thesis. Okay. Um. So the best thing I'll do is that I'll pick Joseph Budu's thesis, which won the best um, vice chancellor's award for best thesis in um, the humanities. I want to show you something. He was my student, so I, I can I can show you that. Maybe in about four years time, one of you can also re replicate a good work and win it again for the College of Humanities or for the business school. Okay, so look at Rich M. Oh, um, let's look at it here. I'll show you different thought processes. Okay, so this is where his empirical data led to open coding, where first other codes were generated. That's the a different set of first order codes were made. Then he went to Asia coding when he did um second order constructs. So for example, first of all, he saw exclusive music and he was doing something in the music industry. So exclusive music and release uh, exclusive music release and subscription fees. 
Then the Asia code, he, he, done the, he came out with beneficial partnership. Then he go to selective coding, uh, exclusivity and culturalization. Aggregated label of digital platform and output, aggregated label of aggregated label of digital platform and finance and constraints. The last one, then you use it to update his format. Okay, so that's what I will just show you right now. Okay, use the same thing for question one, question two. Okay, this one may be more easier for you to understand. First order coding, monetary assurance and revenue maximization. Second order coding, you combine the two, you got the financial value. The third one, then you got you can got financial value, symbolic value, and heritage value. His PhD contributed the value heritage value. That's another value he found at the end of the day. Then he used it to update his work. So if you look at it in the in the actual work, let me go in the actual work. Let me show you uh, in the actual work itself. Uh, so this is all data, 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 data. Good. So remember that he lost. Um, um, uh, let me show you some of the codes, come with codes, and how he gets them. Okay, so look at this one, illustrative constitution. So this is the person he interviewed, digital music platform developer, and then and then the musician. These are quotations come from there. The question is about enabling conditions in the music industry, but the ignorance of musicians relying on shows is a problem. Musicians, musicians think that they can only make money when they play shows or concerts. That's the music platform developer. Then the musician. We rely on shows because that's what we know. I can see cash physically after performing. So look at what he's saying, the, the kind of code he's seeing there. This is the second order concern and first order codes. So the first order, uh, 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 the first order constructs that he's pointing out there is the mindset here and then the ignorance. So you have got ignorance and mindset. When you combine the two, you generate prevailing culture. So the second order construct he's seen in out of it is prevailing culture. Please, are we making make sense here? Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. Um, yes, prof. Um, Mr. Yes. Your brother, is your brother here today? Uh, Francis. Yes. Your brother is around. Yes, Prof, I'm here. Okay. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. Why you have yeah, heard about this in the music industry? The fact that everybody thinks they can play, they only, can only make money when they go and do shows. In fact, that's what actually happened. They say they, the music, they will just play the music, but you can make money from the shows. So if you look at what the musician is saying, they just, they, 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 the musician is saying something out of ignorance. And it's also something that the music developer, the, somebody had, the whole music study, study was about a Ghanaian, an entrepreneur who had developed a platform for the Ghanaians to sell their music on. So he was interviewing the developer, he interviewed the musician. Now, um, Obed, help me here. When you see multiple stakeholders here, what am I trying to achieve here? What type of thing am I trying to achieve here? Oh, Obed is asleep. Problem here. I answer your soft voice. Answer. <laughs> Please come again with a question. I said that you see, you are asleep. I knew you are asleep. When you have <laughs> multiple stakeholders here, get that column alone. What is am I trying to achieve? Uh, so, hmm? so you have multiple be, stakeholders. Uh, what are you trying to achieve? The relationship. So that would be tri tri triangulation. Triangulation. Thank you very much. Now you are waking up. Triangulation. So triangulation means I'm drawing from different people. You see, that means I'm analyzing a very, very a good a, a, every question. I can't take only one person perspective. I brought the platform developer and I brought here, here and I've been able to change here. Okay, now look at another thing here. You see, I didn't show all the data. Before the mindset was generated, he talked about ignorance and he talked about unreadiness. The two of them combined generated mindset and went to generate prevailing culture. So that is one thing that we should be very careful. They, 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 they are, there are a lot of things that are being discussed here. So one of them is mindset, and then another one is culture. Um, that's number two, culture. And then, number two. okay, so let's look at the other point on readiness. So we introduced the game use, which was very difficult to start up because we had to convince musicians, especially their managers, that, that, is, that it was bringing in revenue. My manager, then the musician, my management has not spoken well about selling music online. Maybe we are not ready. 
So there's unreadiness here. So he looks at unreadiness, he looks at the ignorance, he calls it, he generates a variable called mindset. So after that, then he generates a variable called, um, uh, another one called prevailing culture. So if he's going to do his conclusions, the his conclusions are going to be based on prevailing culture. Do you see what I'm trying to say, class? So what you see here is that these are all topical codes, but he had to put in the descriptive codes in here, the type of people who are saying it here, so that I can let you understand that it is not only the platform developers who believe in that, the musician too has his viewpoint. When you bring the two together, it seems that both of there's an issue in, this, uh, in, in the industry. So the industry is presented by the developer and the musician. When you put the two of them together, you have got the industry perspective. So in the Ghana, so if somebody just can then say that in the industry, and the, I hope I can find one of his conclusions for you. How this will lead to a conclusion? Um, conclusions. Okay, so this is another. Uh, now let's see it better. So look at see, see it in a better way. So you have got first order codes: ignorance or unreadiness, skepticism and wrong understanding. Goes to mindset, consumption culture, piracy. Favorable preferences and favorites goes to culture. So the prevailing culture, this is aggregate. That is what you see. Look at this one. Eh? And you remember. Okay, now let me show you something right now. I will show you something. Here. What is different between these two? It's not the same thing. Okay, those of you who are, who can see, can you answer? Can you see what I'm talking about? Compare the two diagrams, can you see what I'm talking about? Hello? Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh, yeah. Yes, bro. Eric, Eric Jaime, can you see what I'm talking about? Yes, bro. Oh. Okay. Yes, Prof. Okay. So, what you see here, what you see here is what I'm trying to do here. So, we start from the first order codes, and then we go to the second order constructs, and we go to the third one, what we select, what we have found. So, if if you realize in writing, you raise it like enabling. Somebody was making noise. Good at all. And the person has come back to you. So if you look at it very carefully, um, look at what enabling conditions make actors want to interact with the digital music platform. With reference to figure 7.1, the supporting evidence in table, uh, seven point, in table 7.1, two enabling conditions present present in the music industry are prevailing culture and business climate. Prevailing culture encompasses the collective mindset of music industries and the culture. In this study, the context, you see what I just said, and the actor's general way of living, specifically how they treat music. Concerning mindset, for instance, this study found that as most musicians focus on becoming popular in, in the hope of landing up calls for up collapse for in live performances after releasing one song or album. Live performances, so now he's going, what he's now doing is what you call a, a, a memory. He's now picking data from information from other places to link what he has found. Memoing happens when you start finding that the codes that you have established or the key findings that you are finding, it has, a, it finds its connection with existing literature. So that we call that memoing. When existing literature connects with um, um, what, what you have found from the data, you have, we call it a point of ideation, which is memory. So when you point, have a point of ideation, you are forced to memo, write down something. I can see a link. I can see, memory can also be in contrast so that you can, so that you can find something that is in contrast to what you what you are expecting. So that one you have to memo. So memory means that you have found something, whether it's in contradiction or confirming or something new to what you're actually thinking about, but you can have, find a link with the literature, whether it's in a link which is confirming or which is contradiction, you have to pause a memo. So in the in analysis, you, you get to a point where you pause and you memo, you write out. What have I found? I found that prevailing culture, I found out the climate, business climate. 
there's a link in the thing. So I can now link with what I found, what I know to the link. I can draw the link and then be able to do it. Be able to point it out. Okay. So look at what he says here. Says here. The business climate also comes. Um, please, can you? I'm reading. Can you see? Or I should make it bigger. We can see. Okay. So let's read here. The business climate also concerns the current arrangements governing the exchange of music of value in the music industry. The business climate captures issues such as value chain deficiencies, competition, and cost of doing business, music business. Within the techno organization context of the uh, music industry, that means that the music industry has a full of organizations and technology at the same time. There is this competition which attracts various actors to interact with the platform, with the digital platform. The finding resonates with previous literature, that is memoing which suggests e-business competitiveness as a factor in successful e-business implementation. So competitive, now he goes on to explain his point. What he's doing is what we call discussion. Why, what we did earlier, this is what we call analysis. What you do down here is called discussion. So in those of you who follow the Mice and Huberman's approach and follow the critical realism approach, you discuss and analyze that is you, you analyze and discuss it. You analyze and discuss. But those who do the interpreting, they analyze in one chapter, then they go and discuss in another chapter. It's all about the who supervises you. But I'm just letting you know. So you, in, in, in what this approach, you are analyzing and then you discuss. So when you find something, you discuss and compare with the literature. When you find something, you discuss and compare with the literature. When you find something, you discuss and compare with the literature. Are you good? Are we good? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Yes. Yes, bro. Thank you very much. So let's go back to um we'll come back to Joseph's thing. Bro. Yes. Please. I oh, you've taken off the slide that I wanted to ask the question. Slide or the screen? Okay. The the screen. The screen. Okay. Um is it about the thesis? This yes, one? please. Okay. Yes, please, bro. Prof, please, I, I beg, let me take you back a little. Now, when we look at the second order constructs, yeah. we have yeah. mindsets, culture, value chain deficiency, competition, and cost of doing business. So, Prof, please, are these the codes that were gotten from the data that was collected? And based on that, within mindset, for example, you have issues of- No, 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 wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm confused. Hold on, I think you're not paying attention. Listen to it. The, 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 the first order was the was let me use the same thing that you must mention. Let me see if I can find that one. Yeah, this is it. The first one was generating the first order code. When you combine the first orders one, then you get the second order. So mindset okay. consists of ignorance. This guy this is not ignorant. You read it. We rely on shows because we that's what we know. I can see the cash fiscally at the performance. This is not ignorance. Yes, it's ignorance. And it's his mindset. Is that not it? Yes. Good. But there is ignorance that generates mindset. So you have to know the first label you give it to. So the, the musician is talking about what he, his ignorance. And the guy also mentioned here, ignorance again. Can't you see the, the MD? The MD of the, the, the entrepreneur. The ignorance of musicians. And this guy is an illustration of the ignorance. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. But it's very interesting. This, is an, this guy said that the people are ignorant. And this is illustration of ignorance. Is that not true? Yeah. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Please, if I'm teaching there and you are not connecting, yes, open it. Please, if you if everybody is asleep, I don't want to expect you to be asleep. If you don't connect, <laughs> you don't <laughs> <you're not laughs> <laughs> <laughs> I'm very. I'm, it affects the way I deliver, and I will I will just teach the thing anyhow. I will just run, rush, run up and go. I have to connect with you so that I can have a say that we are actually making sense. Yes, bro. Prof, we are following. Oh. It's not about you. Really. You have to give me the the response and vibes. Yeah, that that we are connected me. together. You are sleepy as hey. you are following. No, bro, we are because our our, our our mics together. are muted. So sometimes you say <laughs> yes, not knowing that the the mic is mute. That's why you don't hear us. So we we'll, we'll, we'll join the class. Obel, keep your mic up and you speak up. Okay, <laughs> you you are not your house. No, 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 let me find out this thing. Eh? Oh, Prof was explaining something to me. Or you are okay, to I, me okay, that's fine. Let okay, so, finish mine, then you come so to So if you look at it, please. the first order generated the ignorance, unreadiness, and skepticism. So let's look at this uh, skepticism here. At the same time, they were very skeptical. 
these were the same musicians who ran to iTunes and Spotify, but will not run to local versions doing specifically the same thing, where the people can buy the credit card or, or, or where people can buy with, with a credit card or mobile money. I prefer iTunes and Co because my predecessors use it. It is widely known and compared to local platform. I don't know if local ones can work like iTunes and Potsma. This is also about skepticism and then ignorance. So what he does is that because he's triangulating and he's coming up with core conclusions about what's happening in the Ghanaian industry, music industry, he cannot use one person's view. He always has to mm -hmm. use the developer and then the musician so that he can get different. And these are different musicians. In fact, just I should have written musician A, B, C, so that I can know that maybe this is a musician highlight, musician hip hop, musician, but he didn't do that. That is more data he could have given. Do you understand mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say? He could have done into yeah. bracket musician yeah. highlight, musician hip hop, musician, or do musician one, two, three, then in a table show you musician one is a high life that has been it for seven years. Some people do it like this musician, comma, uh, into bracket, high life, comma, seven years in industry. Uh, and musician, mm. uh, listen, then the right maybe RB, 10 years in industry, so that you know that if the person is talking, is this a depth of knowledge he has to bring to the music that, or musician? A three time award winner of Ghana Music Awards or something like that, so that I can know the type of person. That's why descriptive quotes are important. Obed, I, I hope you understand what I'm saying now. Yes, 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 yes. That's why descriptive quotes, Joseph used a simplistic one because he wanted to just give you the labels. I think there's a part where he explains a categories of people that he interviewed. But ideally, ideally, to be able to lend credence to what you are saying and the weight of the quote, I would have expected that. The music developer is one person, but the musicians, you should differentiate them. So the musician, you put into bracket by each position, how many years he has been in the industry, what type of gen general he, is to, he can come from. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So that if you are making an like, argument, you can, somebody can even start saying that, I see a pattern come from the high life musicians, which is different from uh, what I see, I hear from um, um, the, maybe the, uh, the, is it the, the whatever? It's the, right. oh, Hip life. Hip life. Hip life. Hey, the hip life was well, good. Or, or maybe the older musicians, like um, 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 last time we used to go JP, good. So go JP yes. and go against this, the, the young boys who have come out. I don't even know them. The young boys who have just come out. Mike Sotawali. Kofi Kenata. Sotawali. Those people, the, the way they are being doing that, I don't know whether they are a young boy or they are old boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Eugene. I'm a Eugene. Okay, so... You see, the inter interesting thing about the music industry is that sometimes you can't see whether their career will stay on like Kujenshi. Three years' time or five years' time, you may not hear about them again. So it's very difficult. Oh, to oh some of them have been in the game for some a decade. Them, yeah. 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 Okay. 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 They have been in the game for a decade. Okay. Thank you very much. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that I don't know. So you are the one telling me. <laughs> anyway. So. Yeah, yes, Prof. Let me. I don't know if you are done with his question. So no, I'm not done with his question. So what I was trying to just point out is that when you when you when you are picking your quotes, know what you are trying to do in terms of triangulation, and then know what you are trying to identify. So um, when you come to the when we come back to the to this, the mindset you came out from. So this is actually an abstraction to show you that. This is what was happening in that table. That's why I say combining figure 7.1 and table 7.2. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes. This is much yes, more, and, 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 and this is what we call data display. Oh my. Remember what we, let's go back again. <laughs> you, all of them are happening at the same time. That is what happens with a qualitative. That's why the arrows are, it's kind of iterative. So look at it. We are doing data condensation in this particular diagram, but we are able to let you understand we use data display. So the mm. table is a data display technology, and then the diagram here is also a data display. The logic diagram here is also a data display technology. So when you finish this one, then we can do drawing and verifying conclusions. So how you do, you draw by showing that you have been able to draw prevailing culture and business climate. Now verify the conclusion by discussing memo, Memo it with other literature, what is happening in the industry from other perspectives that you can be able to verify it. So that's what Joseph has in the, in the simple page. Joseph has done all of this, all of it at the same time for you to see. He has shown you your data, he has done the data collection and categorized the data. He has displayed the quotes for you to see. After describing, disclosing the quotes for you to see. He went on to do the coding. 
and you did the coding, open coding to generate the first order codes, and then went on to the the second order codes where I did is axial code, then you went to the selective codes and you did the last one. Okay. Now I've answered this question. Who has another question? Aha, so this is the conclusions. Look at it. Finding one. In the music industry, you see where this has come because he wanted to say in the music industry, he had to show two people. Prevailing culture and business climate are conditions that attract or repel industry actors to interact with this music platform. That's finding one. But because he saw differences, he wants to show the difference. Finding one A, people's mindset and culture attract and repel industry actors to interact with uh, 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 this uh, 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 music platform. And finding one B, value chain deficiency and competition cost of doing business attract and repel. Where is the value chain deficiency all those kind of, this one. He's telling you, he has given you the summary based on A, B, but now he's breaking them down. Those which are prevailing culture and those which are business climate. You see that? Yes, bro. What Joseph yes, could have bro. done is that he could have done in the music industry, prevailing culture into bracket, mindset and culture. Attract and then business climate into bracket, value chain and deficiency, competition and cost of doing business. By being able to break it down, he has shown that this is what we call finding the, the, the the conclusions and verifying conclusion. So I mentioned his verifying conclusion with the discussion here, then he's producing it at the end. So he says that what the, for, the foregoing discussion underpins the following findings. So in, 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 in Mars and Huberman approach, which is also a critical realism approach, which is also used by Relis too. One of the things that you have to understand before you can come out with a finding, then you should have used your data to point us to the finding. You should start with your first order codes, go to your second order constraints, go to your theoretical uh, conclusions and then you come up with your selective or you're going to your selective co coding or the themes or the networks that you found at the end of the day then at the, then go and discuss them and after this coming suggest your findings the same thing so if you are doing a thesis with this one you get travel you go to you have to do it for each of them each, each of them depending on what you're trying to answer each of them so by the time you finish this is how it, it comes to inform his study. So that one will come up later. So let's let me answer the next question. Yes. Thanks, Prof. Thank you. Um, um my has to do with the, the the semantics or the language. You know, when you are displaying uh, his thesis, we we're using first order code, second order construct, and then the conclusion. But what is showing on the uh, board, uh, sorry, on the screen now. In the, in the lecture slide, you can see that they are using different languages. Open coding, Azure no, 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 coding. no, you are making mistakes. Okay. Open coding, Azure coding, and selective coding are all processes. Okay. What I use here rather was the names. I call them topic codes, descriptive codes, and then what inferential codes and patching codes. The names that you find say a lot of them depending on the author. And that's one of the reasons why that you should have gone back to Joseph's methodology that's why methodology matters and when i began if you remember everybody who remember just um, i don't know whether Uber, you are awake at that time do you see that i went out i showed something in in, in his methodology if you remember when i opened joseph's work at first i showed something in his methodology do you remember no you don't remember no you don't remember i showed this thing uh oh this diagram yes yeah. uh, yeah, it's a diagram Wait, you guys, we remember. Don't know what you guys remember, we didn't know it was under the methodology. So the, gen the gentleman was the question. You let me answer you. The rest of the class, they are Let's let me answer you. You are the one who has seen the difference. You are called the vision. <laughs> gentleman, can you see the same thing? You are saying that Joseph is different. Yes. Can you see that thing? Open yes, coding is yes, out. Please, what's your name? The guy who has the question is Abdul Karim Mutosa. Okay, Karim. So, Karim, yeah. can you see that open coding, the output of open coding is what? First order codes. Okay, yeah. Good. And first order codes can be topical or descriptive or both. In fact, Joseph only is using the, the topical, but he's informing it with the descriptive. So, if he goes back to the table, he put the descriptive on one column and then he end up generating the topical. You see, that's what Joseph did. Yeah. Then number two, axial coding. What is the output of axial coding? Second order what? 
Second order contract. contract. Good. Yeah, there is selective yeah. coding output. That's the aggregate more. of what you have found. Maybe. Then from there, you update your pre-study code. That's why you, you suggest your finding. He he he's using a method, a method coming from grounded theory, which is also linked to mass and human man. All these are techniques. In fact, this one is a technique, it's not even a method, I would call it. They are techniques for analysis. So he has using this, he's using that technique for analysis, but he's using based on Cheng's work, Cheng 2018. So those of you who don't know Chen 2018, you can go to Joseph's listen. He has even got more in the back. So Chen 2018. Hey, it's not in the thesis. I know it's TS. Okay, so how foreign knowledge spillovers by returning managers or okay, care domestic for an institutional theory perspective. So it's somebody's paper that you got the idea for. Okay. International business review, can go and look at it. But all of them are all analytical techniques. It's not what Chen developed it. It's just like it was using the paper. In fact, one thing that Prof. Ifa always used to talk about, which I like about what he said is that when you are doing something and you know that you don't know have anybody support you find somebody who has used the same methodology in his work and then put the person to support your work that is safer than just being alone so that's what he has done but this is all coming from um, a mouse and human mind and coming from granite theory we use this kind of way yes any other so how do we develop the codes we develop the codes either prescribed specified from the literature or from what people are telling you, the, the voices you are hearing, sorry. The, the, the framework, and then the framework means are coming from the literature or the research framework you have, or data-driven approach. Coming from the data that you have collected, you can inform, like what the guy said, we only, we, as for us, we want fiscal cash in our hands. That was also ignorance. You can see, and, and that one is not even coming from the literature, it's coming from what the person was saying. So those, those two are, are needed. What do I mean by the framework is that sometimes some of the variables in your work can, as the person is speaking, you can see like, oh, this is an example of what the person, example of maybe um, um, nepotism. This is an example of this behavior, this leadership style. They can be able to categorize it as such. Now, there's something we call internal validity. Now, Joseph illustrated internal validity by establishing conditions for something to occur before innovation. Can you see my can you see my screen? Yes, yes Before innovation could occur, Joseph had to prove that content innovation exists, technological innovation could exist, and take order restructuring exists. Before any of these things could occur, Joseph had to show that this one. So the first order codes were coming from the right the data. And from the data, he generated the second order. If you jump the second order and from there content additions and they call it innovation you can have a problem or if you just saw the content additions there in the literature just say that oh this is a prevailing culture this is innovation you have a problem you didn't establish sufficient evidence to be able to generate that particular uh, output that is what we are talking about internal validity so when i go and I talk about prevailing culture business climate, you can be able to say that, oh, it's true, I agree with what he, uh, agree with Joseph from his work because he established other things to be able to show that this is what is occurring in the data. Sometimes some students are like that. All of a sudden they see that, you know, oh, this is a, an example of uh, 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 calculated co commitment. What were the things that you saw that led to calculated commitment? Anyway, so that is it. Are you learning something good? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Okay. So let's look at another example. This one is about, um, oh, sorry. This one is about doing a PhD in the University of Lycan. So PhD supervision is experiencing the University of Lycan. Two students were interviewed. One student said that supervisors are usually world bank experts, very knowledgeable, but often away for global assignments. 
One code we can see there, knowledgeable supervisors. What type of code is it? A descriptive code. It's a descriptive code, which is also a first order. I said, yes, describe it. Okay. Now, I spent more time on Skype for discussions with my supervisor, limited face to face interaction. That's what? Limited face to face discussion. That's what? Perfect. Let me show. Okay, so let's take it on. Um, all codes have to have three characters. They are supposed to be valid. Code should accurately reflect what is being researched. Number two, they should be mutually exclusive. Means that codes should be distinct and not overlap. That's what Joseph was trying to show here, that they are distinct on their own. And they are exhausted. It should be able to fit, the data should fit into the code. So if you look at it very carefully, the, the data is not trying to explain something else. Look at this one. Okay. Okay, let's do that. This is, uh, okay, so, um, Francis, look at you. This is your area. Monetary assurance, revenue maximization, revenue generation, all of them is what financial value. Is that true? Hey, he's asleep. Okay, all right. Rest <laughs> time. Is that oh. true? No, he's analyzing it. <laughs> Trust and access branding is a form of value, but it's interpersonal. It's a person. So it's also interpersonal value. Okay. Now, legal access, which, uh, privacy reduction, intermedi this intermediation is a non financial value. Artistic preservation, history preservation, preservation of authenticity, cultural value. Perpetual ownership, memory preservation, generational value. The two of them, he called that these two types of value as heritage value. Non-financial value, he says symbolic. So somebody puts um, symbolic means that you know when you put gamro sticker on your on your cassette, it makes it look like you can't pirate it because it's gamro. Yeah. Oh, so it's a symbolic value. Okay. So that's piracy rejection. Now the financial value plus interpersonal value become what is functional value. His function as a what? As an artist, what is gaining? He gains some financial value, he gets some interpersonal value, some credibility in that one. So he gets him some functional value there. So he came up with the different types of value that you can generate from a music platform, the functional value, symbolic value, and heritage value. You cannot generate heritage value if you didn't prove that there's cultural value and generational value. And if you didn't prove that there is artistic preservation, historical history preservation, and preservation of authenticity in the cultural one and the other one, these things have to occur before the other ones will occur. And you have to show it here. Okay. Do you understand it? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Okay. So what can we say about the PhD in this university? First of all, you can say that by the time we finish summarizing, so this one, I've jumped a lot of the quotes. When I combine them, so I'm now reading my selective coding. I can see that there's a technoculture, or maybe I can say I'm at Asia code, maybe Asia. Let me see Asia. Technoculture environment, because you need to be, you have to be online all the time. As the student two said it. Number three, and another point is that you just you have to be globally oriented because most of your students, most of your supervisors work with World Bank and they're globally oriented. And there's also limited face-to-face -face discussion. So you have to be proactive on your own. So you can also say that there's proactive. If, if you are a PhD student going to do a PhD, then you have to be proactive and individualistic. You should also be prepared to become more a global oriented and you also have a technical culture affinity that you are going to do more things online. So these are the three characteristics of a person going to do PhD there. So sometimes the question you are asking is what helps in terms of analysis you do on the data. The data can be there, but the question you are asking tells us that the kind of PhD. So if a person is coming to do a PhD in this university, 
You should have these three characteristics. That's all it means. Okay. So in terms of analytical coding, it involves interpretation of the data and conceptualizing and theorizing the data. So let's look at an example. A man interviewing interview is discussing the need for community action. Okay. Now the man interview is discussing the need for community action in the local council election, in which a school teacher is a candidate. This man says that he never listens to gossip about the school teacher. It's women staff. But he just worried about that. He's not worried that she's standing for local council when she is not obviously not a responsible person. That's what the person is saying. So it tells you that there are some protracial perspectives from the man. So in the civil code, we can talk about the type of person he's talking. The man is a male, he's 45 years old, and he's a tradesman. So you can say a tradesman who are older. These are the views they are saying. Number top, the two, the topical codes. What is being discussed? The need for community action. The school teacher. Uh, okay. So in two ways, the coding had described the, the in two ways, the coding had described the person. What sort of person offered the ideas and what do we about? So the description is, code will always tell you what the entity is. And the topical code will tell you what the person is, what is being discussed. I mentioned that one earlier, we're just going through it. But when you want to do analytical code, you bring the two together. When you bring the two together, there are several things that can come up, several things about patriarchal assumptions coming from people who are 45 years and above a male. Uh, number two, the credibility of gossip. They say that he doesn't really, Listen to gossip. So he's, he's thinking that is it women? Is it women's staff? So women are the ones who gossip. Informal networks of women, play, the authority of school teachers, the interplay of interpersonal and political. Okay. So what can we then see? Because of the axial rules that we have. The, the patterns you have been able to identify and the actual code you are going to put together. We can then ask ourselves certain questions or go to some selective con conclusion. Are men saying that they don't gossip? Are the negative attitudes to the code to school teacher coming from the mainly over 40s? How do we relate to the attitudes to community action? Okay. Now there's a hand raised up, so that let me answer that question. And I want to see whether any other person see other view, any other viewpoints, any other uh, inferences you can make from what the case that I just presented. Is there any other viewpoints that have been made apart from what I will summarize on the screen? The hand is up. Can you ask your question? Yeah, Prof. It's, it's Abdul Karim. The 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 second order construct. Um. The construct itself, or are they derived from theory? Or if yes, if uh, what about if you are analyzing something which is not in, in, found in any theory, the construct is not from theory, how will you classify such a thing? Maybe we can give an example. An example of what? Uh, looking at uh, the, the, the thesis we have displayed, uh, we have a um, certain first order coding that are leading to a construct. And then uh, I want to know if those constructs are defined in theory. Oh, okay, no, 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 not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay, so let me point one of them. Okay, so let me go back to this one. I'm going back to this. This construct that you see here, financial value is in the ECC, is in the thesis. So if you go to the, um, the, the, his, his, um, his work, he actually pointed out in the beginning that what you may gain is financial value. Let me see the chapter, the forms of value you can gain. Okay. It's 
Can you see it? Look at this one. This is what he found. He says that the digital platform value are functional and symbolic. And he has explained the work. What is an function? What is symbolic? He said, could there be others? That's why he put the comma. So in his, in his final stage, he found out there was another one called what? Heritage. But the symbolic and the functional was coming from the literature. Do you understand me? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Okay. Heritage. Oh, I think that's a heritage one. But the heritage came from the literature. It came from the thesis. But the oh, other okay. one, the functional, based on resource, resource based logic, functional value occurs through the process of converting data. So he's explaining it here. So that is coming from here. Then he has another one called symbolic, which is he, also explained somewhere in the thesis. So the question you're asking is true. Remember what I told you that. The, the, state, the, the framework can guide you and then the distance can guide you to the data can guide you. So if you go back to Joseph's work. If you go back to Joseph's work, the... The value part. So the the frame the the this one came from the function came from the t from the thesis itself, and then a, a symbolic came from the thesis itself. The heritage was generated. So means that financial and interpersonal were part of what he, he talked about. But to be able to identify them, he, he identified them as this in the study. And he led to this. That's why I said that you can be informed by. You, you can be informed by what's the name? You can be informed by the, the theory, or you can be informed by I mentioned somewhere. You can be informed by the theory, you can be informed by the data. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, so the naming of the codes it yeah. comes from different authors. Mouse and Huberman just use descriptive codes and packing codes, but Richards use Richards 2005 uses topic codes and analytic, analytic codes. Then Garnet theory uses in vivo codes, open codes. Asia codes and then selective codes. So the names of the codes and the type of codes are all dependent on who, who, who you are talking about. That's why I said that Mars and Huberman and Riches use descriptive and topic codes. And then the same is, is also the same as pattern codes and analytic codes coming from uh, at the second level from Richard and then Mars and Huberman. Now, the next step is the memoing, when you start writing. Memoing is theorizing write-up of ideas about codes and their relationships as they strike the analysis files coding. It can be a sentence, a paragraph, or a few pages. It exhausts the analyst's momentary ideation uh, based on the data up with perhaps a little conceptual elaboration. So as, a, as with the higher levels of coding, the most important thing about substantive and theoretical memos is that they are conceptual content and it's not simply describing data. When they help the analysis move from the descriptive and empirical to the conceptual level, they are therefore especially important in induction since they move analysis towards the developing of propositions. Propositions are the findings that we saw at the end. So when data finds link with theory or previous literature, we call it a point of ideation where you memo. So you have got confirmatory memoing when all of it link confirms something and you have got this, this confirmatory memo when it is in contrast. So in the previous, in my previous papers, sometimes I have done a, an example of confirmatory memoing. For example, in the mobiles and micro, micro trading papers, I was comparing findings from case A and case B. And after that, I did an abstraction from what I can see from the, the common, what is common from both, and then use it to be able to do a confirmatory memoing. In case A, AA uses the mobile phone's calendar functionality to schedule times to supply her customers who need tomatoes. In case B, customers are able to monitor the delivery times of goods and plan for contingencies through test messages. This communication medium. This, this communication medium creates a borderless environment or redefines the place factor 
in transacting business with the customers and creating more personalized services for them. Personalized services lead to deepening relations, which can contribute to customer loyalty and retention. Williamson refers to this phenomenon as deepening relationships. This phenomenon of deepening relationship as asset specificity, a transaction characteristic which, de which depicts customers logged into a transaction for a consider considerable time. So I looked at the transaction cost theory, and Williamson talked about uh, that as a point in time that between the relation between the, when the relation between the the part but the parties or customers and then the providers or the, the the firms who are providing services to them becomes a deepening relationship it means that they are logged into the relationship in, or into the transaction for a considerable consider, considerable time, and that phenomenon of deepening deepen relationship is known as asset specificity. Asset specificity. Okay. Contradictory memoing happens when there is a contrast. For example, traders predominantly use mobile phones to improve existing trading activities. These include communication and information information exchange with James. Is there any problem with customers and trading partners? Uh, James, because with customers and trading partners um, through the use of voice calls and text messages. Little can be said about transformational impact of mobile phones. Contrary to previous research on mobile phones used by fishermen and farmers in Ghana, there is no evidence of the use of mobile banking services in micro trading activities. Now, in the previous work I had done on mobile service and farmers, I found mobile banking to be a critical transformational and value or impact that the people were obtaining. But when I went to the market to I didn't see that. So I didn't see any transformational impact. What I was seeing more of more, more of um, incremental impact and then maybe sometimes product impact. So what I then saw, what I then tried to emphasize here is that contrary to the previous research where I saw transformational impact, there's no evidence of using mobile banking in, in, the, in this particular study. So there's no transformational impact. This finding perhaps stands for the differences in, in terms of the economic volume and type of transaction involved in fishing and farming as compared to micro trading activities interview the micro trading activities of traders, in, micro trading activity of traders interviewed in the research. What am I trying to say? The reason why I didn't see mobile money as key being used in around for my study in around 2011, being used by them for the study was that one, it could be the fact that the volume of trade was not that high enough for market to to consider using mobile money as of that time. But now that the volume of trade is increasing, they would have been using it. But at that time, the volume of trade between farmers and then those who buy from the between farmers and fishermen, those who buy from them was high. So she followed, she followed that. So I've got confirmatory memoing and then you have got contradictory memoing. Okay, so one other point we talked about data display. Data display is about organizing and compressing and assembling information in a, in, a, in a visual form. So you can use charts, you can use tables, you can use graphs, and can use even diagrams and, and models to show, to show that. Well, now why do we organize the data in terms of this, um, display the data in this in using these kind of tools? In order to be able to exp explain and establish themes and also become a way of summarizing the data so in a way that people can be able to relate with it and then become the base of future analysis. So if you look at Joseph's own, Joseph did a diagram here, so we could relate with it and it became the base of discussion. So based on the diagram he discussed here, so with reference to figure 7.12, this study process explanation of the platform value and outcome discovered three types of, what is he doing? He's pointing out what is coming, what is, what he found out there and is traction the discussion. So what are we saying? Good qualitative analysis involves repeated and iterative displays of data. Repeated iterative. So you can see Joseph using this particular diagram several times, always repeating himself to do, showcase the data, showcase the data, showcase the data. So that, and that's a sign of a good qualitative research. Okay, so data display can also be shown here. This one is from my car company, and we're showing the process of which they deliver the cars. Then the last part is the drawing and verifying conclusions. Based on what you have displayed, what can you see? 
What do you know? Sorry. Based on what you are displaying, what can you say? What can you know? Now, so Huberman talks about the fact that you should be able to develop early conclusions and, and after that, try to defend it or make it better. So that's what usually we do. We suggest certain relationships and then as you write your, write, write, do your write-up and you find more data, you shape the relationships. So you use about 13 touches for drawing the meaning conclusions and also use about 13 for testing and confirming findings. You can read about them in their work, but I'll give an example as we go on. Now, according to Marcel and Huberman, at the first level, you are discovering abstract, abstract concepts. That's from the data and raising a conceptual level of the data. Then you go to Axial code, discovering in the data connection between the abstract concept. Then the last one, selective code, you are selecting the core category by concentrating on basic social processes, evidence the data, and raising the level of abstraction again to the core category, elaborating the core uh, elaborating the core category. So that's what you saw yourself do. Axial code in the open code, in Azure code, in, and then selective code. Now, if it's quantitative, that is why you call it. You are asking now, Joseph is using first order, second order. You didn't let me finish, so you see it here. First order construct is coming from Mouse and Huberman. Second order string construct is coming from here again. Then you go to the, the, the conclusions and the verifications or the construct that we develop. Now, in quantitative studies, those of you have done qualitative, quantitative data analysis before, exploratory analysis, you see it's the same thing. At the first time, you have items and you measure them to get a variable. Then you look at the factor analysis to be able to generate the factor that matter. That's what you are doing. And that's the similar thing that's what we are doing. Okay. So conclusions from the study. That was the paper size, the one from the micro trading and, the, and then the women. Some of the key conclusions that we came up with is that the innovative use of mobile in micro trade is influenced by pre-knowledge of the trader, which may be influenced. Which may be, sorry, which may have been developed through formal education and social networks. Lesson two or finding two. The readiness to use a mobile phone in the trading is influenced by the readiness of the trader and trading partners and customers in the trader's value chain. Number three, in micro trading activities, the benefits obtained by the trader tends to be partly influenced by the extent of mobile phone user by the trader and other and um, used by the trader and other actors such as customers and trading partners in the value chain. So these are key ideas that came of key conclusions that came from the study. And usually these are what we also use in one person study as the key findings. Some of them we call the lessons. But if you realize that the, the key statements are made in relation to this, in relation to the to the the data in micro or the context in micro training activities, this is what you can see. It means that it doesn't cover the whole country, it covers specific industry. You have to speak to the other industry. It, it, and not just the industry, speak to the issues related to that one. Okay. So how do you write it out? That's um how people write it out. If you look at it here, they discuss it, then they come and say, these findings are suggested with the fourth lesson. Uh, then you state the fourth lesson. Then you discuss again, do the memory. Then come back, you come and say, these findings. This readiness partly defines the benefits obtained. These findings are suggested with the third lesson. So then you provide the third lesson, the third finding. Okay, so there are 13 things that you should use to generate. Wait, my time is up. 13 things that you should generate meanings or conclusions. Noting, noting the patterns you see in your data. See whether it's possible. It's possible. Check it for possibility. Does it make sense? Is it true? Is it possible that it's true? See whether clustering, clustering what goes with it. You see what Joseph was doing, was doing clustering. He was make, blend, joining some variables together, some statements together, and some, some um, first order codes together, to, and some, some, some other codes together to be able to generate a construct. Making metaphors, integration in, in diverse pieces, in, in, integration to diverse pieces, pieces of data. So you bring the, 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 the data you have and you put them together to tell a story and you put a, a, a kind of explanation or a metaphor, a code or a label on them. Counting to see what there's there. Sometimes the counting may be important. Making contrast and comparison. Partitioning the variables. That's the same thing, same thing you see the, the diagram here. And then subsuming the particulars into a, a general.
Okay. Then you also have um, factoring, generating factors of conscious out of what you have found. Noting relationship between the variables, finding the intervening variable, whether something's okay before that's okay. And then building a logical chain of evidence to your case study report, your logical, your, your, your protocol, case study protocol, and then uh, your data protocol. And then building, making conceptual and theoretical coherence. Okay, linking back to what has been taught. Now, to be able to check for finding, check whether and confirm the findings, verify. You have to check for representativeness. This thing I found, is it just in only this part or it compares with others? Number two, check for researcher first. Is the researcher not being biased by what he's seeing or coming, coming out of it, speaking out of a bias? Triangulating from different data sources. What are the different data sources I can use? Joseph was using the musician and then the data is the, the, the music player, the music developer himself. Okay, weighing the evidence against one and one against the other. Sometimes you have to compare evidence against each other. That's when you do comparative analysis in your work. And then checking the meaning of outliers. So sometimes you may find out something that's not part of it, but it, it gives you a different answer, it gives you a different impression. So you want to check out what could have caused it. Under what condition did this, this, could, have, could, have, could, this could have happened? What could be the issue? What could be the reason why this is happening? For example, you find out that some one of the just finds out that one of the musicians is um is already on iTunes and all those kind of things. And still wants to be on this platform because most of the people are saying they don't want to be on this platform. So why? You may find out this as a, div a deviant to the sample. So why could it be happening? Doing following up of surprises or using extreme cases. So sometimes you may find out something which is different, and you want to follow up. But why could it have occurred? Why, do, why does it occur this way? Okay. And then looking for negative evidence. Sometimes you may have to also check whether this is too true, too true for you to believe. Something is a relationship is proposed. You find out that whether there's could be another perspective to the issue. Ruling out, making if then test, and then rule out spurious relations. Okay. Replicating a finding. Trying to see that they, when you can find other data that can replicate the finding for you. Checking out rival explanations. Why could you have occurred? Any other reason why it could have occurred? Okay. So you are going to another one called party match. I'll end it here. Then maybe next week, try to illustrate with the uh, software, then talk about party match and thematic analysis. So thank you very, very much. I know it's been a lot. It's been a lot, but I think it's thank been you. Thank you, bro. Yeah, I have to get the video as soon as possible to all of you so that you can re revise um, if I'm right. That would be very useful, that.